New York's classic rock, Q1043. Oh, you caught me lighting up. Oh. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Good morning. How are Hello, you? Brian. Doing great. How is everyone? Fine, thank you. Brian Regan with us uh, this morning here at Q104.3. I was just checking your uh, touring schedule. You're going to leave home, I guess, on November 10th, perform on November 11th, and keep going until, like, June. I mean, wow. <laughs> without, without ever going back home again. I mean, you have such an intense, incredible schedule that includes November 13th at the Beacon Theater on it's Broadway here in New York. It's the uh, Gilligan's Island tour. I, uh, <laughs> I went out for three hour, a three-hour tour, and I never went back. Well, you know, I, w I was thinking of the concert performance of a great comic versus the concert performance of a great musical talent, and they have a catalog of well-known songs to fall back on that they can perform all the time, show after show, year after year. People show up because they want to hear the hits. You have to create new material all the time. That's why I want to uh, get get into the music business and uh, <laughs> get out of this silliness. No, it's um, I talk about comedians. I talk with comedians about this all the time about the difference between music and comedy. Most people say when they go to a concert of a famous uh, band or musical artist, they always say, "I want to hear the hits. I want to hear the hits," and it's got to be so frustrating for musical artists, you know, to have to play songs that were big for them back in the eighties and nineties or whenever. And uh, comedy is a whole different animal, man. If you're doing stuff that you did <laughs> from the eighties and nineties, you know, people, uh, I don't think they're going to be too thrilled. Comedy requires a surprise. You know, I when I talk to the creators of the Blair Witch Project, which some say is the scariest movie ever made, they said writing for a horror movie is like writing comedy, that you have the punchline and the scare. It, you don't have the audience. It's interesting. I, I never made the analogy with a, a horror movie, but now I understand why when people come up to me after shows, they say that felt like a horror movie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> come on. Sure not. You are so loved. You just, you just mention your name to people and they go, he's huge. Uh, well, I'm very, very honored to have a follow. But isn't, isn't one of the reasons why your fan base is so loyal is because you share so much of your real self with them? I mean, it goes beyond just observational comedy. You really let your audience know you and, and who you are. That might have something to do with it. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I see so many performers who go on stage and seem to have a bit of a facade, you know, whether they're stand-up comedians or musical artists or whatever. It's like... It, and these facades can be quite professional. You know, you can hear the voice and, ha and have a very professional facade, but it still feels like you're not really getting to know the, the person. So I, I, just, I just like to be myself when, when I'm on stage. Uh, maybe in the punchlines, I'll exaggerate things a little bit and get a little, you know, goofy and exaggerate my reactions to things. But I always like to come back to ground zero and just be, hey, this is just me on stage with you people. Tell is us it, is about it your OCD? Well, it's uh, self-diagnosed, if you will. You know, I'm very, very meticulous and organized. Um, you can probably look at my, <laughs> my shelves backstage. Everything is, uh, you know, chronological and color organized. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, in some ways debilitating, in some ways it's, it's good for my career. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I, I keep a catalog of all my jokes and stuff. Uh, I've been to the, uh, the comedy museum in Jamestown, New York, and they have, uh, 
a nice exhibit from George Carlin, you know, where they show how organized he was and meticulous he was, whether or not he had OCD, I don't know. But, um, you know, I think having a quality like that can help in, in, in this kind of field. Um, it can be kind of a pain off stage when, you know, I have to, just last night I had to stay up until the wee hours of the morning, keeping my, getting my cash organized and make sure I know what every penny is that I spent and, you know, keeping track of my daily journals and what I did and at what time. I don't know why I do this. I don't know who's ever going to need it. Maybe it could be because you like to do it. In Jamestown, New York, that's Lucille Ball's hometown, isn't it? Yes, yes. That's where they have a, uh, a fantastic um, comedy festival that they do once a year. And that is where they have the comedy museum. And it is because that's where Lucille Ball is from. The, the comedy festival is called Lucy Fest. Uh, and by the way, looking over your shoulder on the Zoom screen to the uh, bookshelves that you have behind you, I can see that you have things color-coded. I can see that you've you organized. Know, Jim, Brian is the polar opposite of you. <laughs> I'm look at, look at him. I want to go to your place and organize everything behind you. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Look at, <laughs> Look at that, Brian. Give me, give me an hour in there and it'll all be straightened up. Uh, now, you had, I guess, your first big national break in 1991 on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. And that was during a period of time that we have since exited from in that you could perform on that show as an unknown talent and the next day be walking down the street and people knew your name. I mean, because the audiences for those shows were just so large. Right. And I mean, it, the Tonight Show today with Jimmy Fallon, it's still a successful show, but, but its cultural impact is minimal compared to the kind of impact that Johnny Carson had, say, in 1991. So if he liked you, the next day <laughs> you were a star. I was so fortunate to, to just get on the show. Um, I was on about a, a year before he retired. And at that time, every comedian had the same dream. Every comedian wanted to do the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Now there are, you know, there are many different dreams. People want to do podcasts. People want to get into movies. People want to do this, that, or the other. But at the time, everybody had that dream. And I was fortunate enough to be, I don't know, lucky enough to, to do it. And, and I remember one of the weirdest things about it was when I was introduced, you know, you walk through that curtain and you're walking onto a show that you've seen ever since you were a little kid. And I remember looking over to my right as I'm walking out and uh, there's Johnny Carson sitting behind his desk, but on my right, my whole life I've seen him on the left of the screen, mm -hmm. he's backwards. And then, <laughs> and then I look over to the left and there's Doc Severinsen in the band and, I'm, and, and, both, and both views I remember thinking, I've never had that view in my life. I've never seen the back of Johnny Carson's desk. And then I looked over and I was like, I've never seen Doc Severinsen's band over on the left like that. And all that stuff is going in your head, going on through your head. And there were two marks. You had to walk out to the mark, and it seemed like an eternity. It was like six or seven steps to get out to the mark. The mark is a little X that's on the floor, so you know where to stand. There, well, Just for our friends who don't know what a mark is. Yes, I'm sorry. It's a mark on the floor where you're supposed to stand for camera purposes and that sort of thing. And they made it clear to you that there are two marks. One is Johnny Carson's mark. And they say, don't stand on his mark. That's his mark. He doesn't like it when people stand on his mark. And then there's everyone else's mark. And so when you're walking out, you'll see people, well, if you look at old tapes, at least of mine, you're looking down going, don't step on the mark that will kill your career. <laughs> oh my so, god just a, just a couple of weeks ago um, 
I stood on that stage because the iHeartRadio Theater in Los Angeles is the old Johnny Carson Tonight Show uh, studio. Wow. And just to walk out there, even after all of the years have gone by, just to walk through the corridors and walk out onto that stage uh, is just so exciting. You can just feel it. You stand on the stage and look at the empty seats where the audience would be, and you say to yourself, that's what Johnny saw. And the thing is, you actually saw that in real life as it was happening on The Tonight Show. It was that expression, a dream come true, gets overused in life. But for that particular experience, it, it, it was a dream come true. It was just unbelievable to be fortunate enough to do it. And, um, you know, I'll always have the fondest memories of that night. I only did it once. I mean, he retired a, a year later. And, uh, but boy, that was something else to be able to, to have put into my memory banks. So what By did happen the next day? Well, at the time, you know, that's when Arsenio Hall was on and other shows were starting to, you know, creep into the nightlife. And, um, it wasn't quite as powerful as, as it had been at its peak, you know, he, his numbers were beginning to decline. It does. I don't even like using that word with Johnny Carson because he's such a king, but um, you know, it was, it was big. I, re, I mean, I remember performing at a comedy club the, the next weekend and the place was packed and you know, that wasn't based on me. That was based on John Carson. People just saw that, saw this guy on TV. What he's going to be at the club down the street. Let's go check him out. So it was, uh, it was, it was very powerful. By the, by the way, uh, Brian Regan, who's our guest here at uh, Q104.3. Uh, we were just talking about his appearance in 1991 on the tonight show in Burbank, just a little historical thing, just in case you don't know. You probably know, but in case you don't know, before Johnny Carson moved the Tonight Show from New York to California, that stage was used by Bob Hope. Oh, no, I did not know that. All right. So there's, there's a, a whole aura of comedy coolness that surrounds that. Now, well, if, I, if I can just throw this in there, the show that I was on, Bob Hope was supposed to be on that show. Oh, that's crazy. Oh. It's so bizarre. He was supposed to be the main guest huh. and um, he was filming a special for the return of the troops back in 90, 1991. This, I think, was the first After the Persian Gulf, Gulf War. The yeah. first Gulf War. He was filming a special. So Johnny Carson came. So they introduced the guests for that night. Uh, so they included Bob Hope in the list of guests. He was supposed to be the first guest, but was running late. So uh, they just skipped, and I, I wish I could remember. There was a a, a woman singer who I, I don't remember her name, but they had her sing two songs instead of one. Um, and they just kept assuming when Bob Hope shows up, they'll he'll be the next guest. So it came to my turn. I went out. I did my stand up. I was happy. It went well. I walked back through the curtain. I'm in an, I can't even explain. It's like you just were just on, a, in a, on a, an emotional space mountain ride. Like, this is my dream. I just did it. I walked back through the curtain. The comedy segment producer came up to me and said, Hey, uh, Bob Hope is still not here. Um, we're hoping he's going to show up. But if he doesn't, we're going to throw you back out there at the end of the show to do panel with Johnny Carson. And I'm like, okay. And they said, we don't have time to set anything up. So Johnny Carson will ask you about being from Miami, Florida, and you'd be ready to just go right into five minutes of clean material. Whoa. Yes. And I'm thinking, <laughs> and they said, are you cool with that? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Like in my mind inside, I'm going, what the heck? I had just had about 10 years to get my first five minutes ready. Now I've got about a minute to get my <laughs> second five minutes ready. And it happened. John, Bob Hope did not show up. They brought me back out for the final segment. 
He was incredibly kind to me, you know, like he gave me a nice, gracious re-welcome, if you will. And I walked back out and sat out on the panel and uh, and uh, I did an extra five minutes and it was just unbelievable. The experience was just so crazy. So that's so bizarre that you said that about Bob Hope. And of course, you didn't have to be uh, asked to do clean material because you do do clean material. <laughs> yeah, but I, I guess they just make you know they're just <laughs> careful. No, but, it, no, but in, in in today's world, that makes you kind of uh, unique. Yeah, I mean, I just like doing stand up that way. Um, it, it, it it's not as much of a reflection of who I am off stage because people think I'm much more wholesome off stage, and then if they see me on a golf course, hit my <laughs> third shot in a row into the woods. They get to hear a lot of words that they wouldn't hear from me on stage. But now, I, like I like doing it comedically. Now, of course, on stage, Brian Regan, you are Brian Regan. And looking at your long, long career, all of the, all of the uh, career highlights that you've had, you've always been Brian Regan, except for once. You were Muggsy. You portrayed a character other than yourself. You had to embody a different person. What was that like for you as a performer who's used to being Brian? Well, uh, I'm hoping I'll be able to portray Muggsy even even more. You're, refer you're referring to uh, Louder Milk, which is a TV series that is now on Prime Video. Peter Farrelly is a co-creator. It's a dark comedy about substance abuse and uh ron livingston plays loudermilk who runs a substance abuse group with a bunch of misfits in it and uh i wonder how i got that gig so um and i, I play one of the the people trying to work my way through life i'm a recovering alcoholic and uh you know, it's there. Three seasons are out. We're hoping that they're going to want to make more seasons. Uh, it was thrilling to be on. I, I was very happy that uh, Peter Fairley, he actually saw me at Lucy Fest that we were talking about earlier. That's where he saw me and just asked me if I wanted to be in this show. And I, <laughs> I'm not very good at pushing at, at, you know, at show business and promoting myself. I said, I appreciate you feeling this way, but I, I don't know if I know how to act. And he said, well, I know you can act. And I said, how do you know that? He goes, I just watched you do your standup. He goes, you, you, you do vignettes within your standup. He goes, everything you did was acting. Um, he goes, you do all these little pieces, these little routines, these situations. He goes, all you need is a director who knows how to get that out of you. And, he felt like he, he'd be able to pull that out of me. And uh, so he just cast me in, in this thing. My character was very small in the first season. They gave me a lot more to do in season two. And in season three, they gave me a, a lot of heavy stuff, a lot of heavy emotional stuff, so much different from my standup. And I was just really, really, I don't know, thrilled that they gave me that, that I have been given that opportunity. You know, it's and so weird that that has become a hot topic for humor, you know, on TV, whereas before nobody could see the comedy in it. And now it's just unfortunately so damn relatable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, everybody either suffers from things themselves or they know somebody close to them who suffers with uh, substance abuse or with difficult situations. And man, you can find comedy anywhere. You know, and uh, the thing I like about the show is it's uh, it can it can get dark and twisted. I always have to say to my fans, you got to <laughs> my 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 comedy is clean, but the show is rated, you know, ages 16 plus and there's rough language in it and rough situations. But um, there's a lot of heart in it and a lot of love in it. And all these people care about each other. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, people go off the rails and you know, do things they shouldn't be doing, but uh, it's uh, it's very funny, and uh, people who have seen it really love it. Well, your tour begins November 11th, is that correct? 
And then well, that weekend, that weekend's run. I'm on tour all the time, but that weekend right. begins on the 11th. Yes. Yeah, you're kind of like a country star. You're always on the road, but uh, you'll be at the Beacon Theater on November 13th. One of the most beautiful classic venues in New York, and uh, there are still some tickets available. And if people wanted to uh, connect with you. Uh, on your website, social media and stuff. Why don't you give us the shameless plugs right now? Well, um, you know, brianregan.com is the webpage. Um, Brian Regan Comedian, I think, is my Twitter. You'd think I'd know my own social media stuff. Uh, but uh, if you just Google Brian Regan, you'll get what the, uh, what the correct social media stuff is. All right. And, of course, the uh, special On the Rocks is the uh, current special. And I know that uh, thousands of people are looking forward to seeing you in person here in New York come November. And uh, we thank you for taking the time to spend some time with us this morning here at Q104.3. Hey, thank you. You guys are very nice. And uh, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you guys chatting with me today. Can you just move over to the side just a little bit so I can see the rest of your shelves? Oh, my God. You do see have to come too? over. You do have to come over to my place. You must. You're <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks a lot thank All you right, you guys have a great day new york's classic rock q1043